Hello, hello. Welcome back to another section of Just Kids by Patty Smith. Glad to have you here. Um, we are going to get over halfway in this section, so that is pretty exciting. Um, if you've been enjoying it, uh, give me a little thumb and subscribe so you can catch the rest of the book. But so glad to have you here. Hope that you're having a great week wherever you are. Um, we are on page 116 and uh, let's just let's just jump right in. All right, page 116. We are at a little uh, page break there. All right. Robert's great wish was to break into the world that surrounded Andy Warhol, though he had no desire to be part of his stable or to star in his movies. Robert often said he knew Andy's game and felt that if he could talk to him, Andy would recognize him as an equal. Although I believe he merited an audience with Andy, I felt any significant dialogue with him was unlikely, for Andy was like an eel, perfectly able to slither from any meaningful confrontation. This mission led us to the city's Bermuda Triangle, Brownies, Max's Kansas City, and the factory, all located within walking distance of one another. The factory had moved from its original location on 47th Street to 33 Union Square. Brownies was a health food restaurant around the corner where the Warhol people ate lunch and Max's where they spent their nights. Sandy Daly first accompanied us to Max's as we were too intimidated to go by ourselves. We didn't know the rules and Sandy served as an elegantly dispassionate guide. The politics at Max's were very similar to high school except the popular people were not the cheerleaders or the football heroes, and the prom queen would most certainly be a he, dressed as a she, knowing more about being a she than most she's. Max's Kansas City was on 18th Street and Park Avenue South. It was supposedly a restaurant, though few of us actually had the money to eat there. The owner, Mickey Ruskin, was notoriously artist-friendly, even offering a free cocktail hour buffet for those with the price of a drink. It was said that this buffet, which included buffalo wings, kept a lot of struggling artists and drag queens alive. I never frequented it as I was working, and Robert, who didn't drink, was too proud to go. There was a big black and white awning flanked by a bigger sign announcing that you were about to enter Max's Kansas City. It was casual and sparse, adorned with large abstract pieces of art given to Mickey by artists who ran up supernatural bar tabs. Everything, save the white walls, was red. Booths, tablecloths, napkins, even their signature chickpeas were served in little red bowls. The big draw was surf and turf, steak and lobster. The back room, bathed in red light, was Robert's objective, and the definitive target was the legendary round table that still harbored the rose-colored aura of the absent Silver King. On our first visit, we only made it as far as the front section. We sat in a booth and split a salad and ate the inedible chickpeas. Robert and Sandy ordered Cokes. I had a coffee. The place was fairly dead. Sandy had experienced Max's at the time when it was the social hub of the subterranean universe, when Andy Warhol passively reigned over the round table with his charismatic ermine queen, Edie Sedgwick. Sedgwick. The ladies-in-waiting were beautiful, and the circulating nights were like the likes of Omdine, Donald Lyons, Rauschenberg, Dolly, Billy Name, Lichtenstein, Gerard Malanga, and John Chamberlain. In recent memory, the round table had seated such royalty as Bob Dylan, Bob Neuwirth, Nico, Tim Buckley, Janis Joplin, Viva, and the Velvet Underground. It was as darkly glamorous as one could wish for, but running through the primary artery, the thing that ultimately accelerated their world and then took them down, was speed. Amphetamine magnified their par paranoia, robbed some of their innate powers, drained their confidence, and ravaged their beauty. Andy Warhol was no longer there, nor was his high court. Andy didn't go out as much since Valerie Solanas shot him, but it was also likely he had become characteristically bored. Despite his absence, in the fall of 1969, it was still the place to go. 
The back room was the haven for those desiring the keys to Andy's second silver kingdom, often described more as a place of commerce than of art. Our Max's debut was uneventful, and we splurged on a taxi home for Sandy's sake. It was raining, we did not wish to see the hem of her long black dress trail in the mud. For a while, the three of us continued to go to Max's together. Sandy had no emotional investment in these excursions and served as a buffer to my sullen, restless behavior. Eventually, I fell in line and accepted the Maxis thing as a Robert-related routine. I came home from Schridmer's after seven, and we'd eat grilled cheese sandwiches at a diner. Robert and I would tell each other the tales of our day and share any new work we had accomplished. Then there would be the long stretch of figuring out what to wear to Maxis. Sandy didn't have a diverse wardrobe, but was meticulous with her appearance. She had a few identical black dresses designed by Aussie Clark, the king of King's Road. They were like elegant floor-length t-shirts, unconstructed yet lightly clinging, with long sleeves and a scooped neck. They seemed so essential to her persona that I often daydreamed of buying her a whole closet full. I approached dressing like an extra preparing for a shot in a French New Wave film. I had a few looks, such as a striped boat neck shirt and a red throat scarf like Yves Montan in Wages of Fear, a left bank beat look with green tights and red ballet slippers, or my take on Audrey Hepburn in Funny Face with her long black sweater, black tights, white socks, and black capizios. Whatever the occasion, I usually needed about 10 minutes to get ready. Robert approached dressing like living art. He would roll a small joint, have a smoke, and look at his pieces of clothing, clothing while contemplating his accessories. He saved pot for socializing, which made him less nervous but abstracted his sense of time. Waiting as Robert decided on the right number of keys to hang on his belt loop was humorously maddening. Sandy and Robert were very similar in their attention to detail. The search for the appropriate accessory could lead them on an aesthetic treasure hunt, mining Marcel Duchamp with photographs of Cecile Beaton, Nadar, or Helmut Newton. Sometimes comparative studies could propel Sandy to take a few Polaroids, leading into a discussion on the validity of the Polaroid as art. Finally, the moment would arrive to tackle the Shakespearean question. Should he or should he not wear the three necklaces? In the end, one was too subtle and two had no impact. So the second debate would be, should it be three or none? Sandy understood Robert was factoring an artistic equation. I knew that as well. But for me, the question was to go or not to go. In these elaborate decision-making processes, I had the attention span of a hopped up teenage boy. Page 119 at the start. On Halloween night, when expectant children raced across 23rd Street in their bright paper costumes, I exited our tiny room in my East of Eden dress, stepped upon the white squares of the chessboard floors, skipped down several flights of stairs, and stood before the door of our new room. Mr. Bard had made good on his promise, placing the key to room 204 in the palm of my hand with an affectionate nod. It was right next door to the room where Dylan Thomas had written his last words. On All Saints Day, Robert and I gathered our few belongings, slid them into the elevator, and got off at the second floor. Our new room was in the back of the hotel. The bathroom, which was a bit gritty, was in the hall, but the room was really pretty, with two windows overlooking old brick buildings and high trees shedding the last of their leaves. There was a double bed, a sink with a mirror, and a closet area without a door. We were energized by the change. Robert lined his spray cans under the sink, and I rummaged through my cloth pile and found a length of Moroccan silk to hang over the closet area. There was a big wooden desk that Robert could use as a work table, and because it was on the second floor, I could fly up and down the stairs. I hated using the elevator. It gave me a sense that the lobby was an extension of the room, for it was truly my station. If Robert was out, I could write and enjoy the din of the comings and goings of our neighbors, who would often offer encouraging words. 
Robert stayed up most of the night at the big desk working on the opening pages of a new fold-out book. He used three of the photo booth pictures of me in my Myaskovsky cap and surrounded it with twill butterflies and ages. I felt, and always, as always, a rising pleasure when he used a reference to me in a work, as if through him I would be remembered. Our new room was more suited to me than to Robert. I had everything I needed, but it was not big enough for two people to work. Since he used the desk, I taped a sheet of arches sateen to my section of the wall and began a drawing of the two of us in Coney Island. Robert sketched installations that he couldn't realize and I could feel his frustration. He turned his attention to making necklaces, encouraged by Bruce Rudeau, who saw commercial potential in them. Robert had always liked making necklaces for his mother, then for himself. In Brooklyn, Robert and I had each made each other amulets, which slowly became more elaborate. In room 1017, the top drawer of our bureau was filled with ribbons, string, tiny ivory skulls, and beads of colored glass and silver, gathered for next to nothing at flea markets and Spanish religious stores. We sat on our bed and strung pearls. African trade beads and varnished seeds from broken rosaries. My necklaces were kind of crude, but Robert's were intricate. I wove him leather braids and he added beads, feathers, knots, and rabbit's feet. The bed was not the best place to work, however, as the bed beads would get lost in the folds of the covers or fall into the cracks of the wood floor. Robert hung a few finished pieces on the wall and the rest on a clothes hook on the back of the door. Bruce was very enthusiastic about the necklaces, which moved Robert to develop some new approaches. He envisioned stringing beads of semi-precious stones, mounting rabbit's feet in platinum, or casting skulls in silver and gold. But for now, we used whatever we could find. With little capital, we had to be extremely inventive. Robert was a master at transforming the insignificant into the divine. His local suppliers were Lanston's Five and Dime across the street and the Capital Fishing Tackle Shop a few doors down from the Chelsea. The Capital was a place to pick up rain gear, bamboo fly rods, or an ambassador reel, but it was the small things we were looking for. We bought hair jigs, feathered lures, and tiny lead weights. The musky bucktail lures were best for necklaces as they came in a multitude of colors as well as spotted tail and pure white. The owner would just sigh and give us our purchase in a little brown paper bag like the kind used for penny candy. It was pretty obvious we weren't qualified fishermen, but he got to know us, offering low prices for broken lures with good feathers and a used tackle box with unfolding trays that was perfect for our supplies. We also kept watch for anyone ordering shellfish at the El Quixote. After they paid the check, I would gather the lobster claws in a napkin. Robert scrubbed, sanded, and spray-painted them. I would say a little prayer to thank the lobster as he strung them on a necklace, adding brass beads between small knots. I made bracelets, braiding shoestring leather, and using a few small beads. Robert confidently wore everything we made. People were showing interest, and Robert had hopes of selling them. There was no lobster at the Automat, but it was one of our favorite places to eat. It was fast and cheap, but the food still seemed homemade. Robert and Harry and I often went together, getting the fellows underway could take a lot more time than eating. The routine went something like this. I have to fetch Harry. He can't find his keys. I search the floor and locate them under some esoteric volume. He starts reading it, and it reminds him of another book he needs to find. Harry rolls a joint while I look for the second book. Robert arrives and has a smoke with Harry. I know then it's curtains for me. When they have a smoke, it takes them an hour to accomplish a 10 minute thing. Then Robert decides to wear the denim vest he made by cutting the sleeves off his jacket and goes back to our room. Harry thinks my black velvet dress is too bleak for daytime. Robert comes up the elevator as we go down the stairs. Frantic comings and goings like playing out the verses of Taffy was a Welshman. Horn and Hardart, the queen of automats, was just past the tackle shop. The routine was to get a seat and a tray, then go to the back wall where there were rows of little windows. 
You would slip some coins into a slot, open the glass hatch, and extract a sandwich or fresh apple pie. A real Tex Avery eatery. My favorite was chicken pot pie or cheese and mustard with lettuce on a poppy seed roll. Robert liked their two specialties, baked macaroni and cheese and chocolate milk. Both Robert and Harry were mystified that I didn't appreciate Horn and Hardart's famous chocolate milk. But for a girl raised on Bosco and powdered milk, it was too thick, so I just got coffee. I was always hungry. I metabolized my food quickly. Robert could go without eating much longer than me. If we were out of money, we just didn't eat. Robert might be able to function even if he got a little shaky, but I would feel like I was going to pass out. One drizzly afternoon, I had a hankering for one of those cheese and lettuce sandwiches. I went through our belongings and found exactly 55 cents, slipped on my gray trench coat and my off-ski cap, and headed out to the automat. Mayakovsky, excuse me. I got my tray and slipped in my coins, but the window wouldn't open. I tried again without luck, and then I noticed the price had gone up to 65 cents. I was disappointed, to say the least, when I heard a voice say, Can I help? I turned around, and it was Allen Ginsberg. We had never met, but there was no mistaking the face of one of our great poets and activists. I looked into those intense, dark eyes punctuated by his dark, curly beard and just nodded. Alan added the extra dime and also stood me to a cup of coffee. I wordlessly, wordlessly followed him to his table and plowed into the sandwich. Alan introduced himself. He was talking about Walt Whitman, and I mentioned I was raised near Camden, where Whitman was buried. When he leaned forward and looked at me intently, Are you a girl? he asked. Yeah, I said. Is that a problem? He just laughed. I'm sorry. I took you for a very pretty boy. I got the picture immediately. Well, does this mean I return the sandwich? No, enjoy it. It was my mistake. He told me he was writing a long elegy for Jack Kerouac, who had recently passed away. Three days after Rimbaud's birthday, I said. I shook his hand and we parted company. Sometime later, Alan became my good friend and teacher. We often reminisced about our first encounter, and he once asked how I would describe how we met. I would say you fed me when I was hungry, I told him, and he did. Our room was getting cluttered. It now contained not only our portfolios, books, and clothes, but the supplies Robert had stored in Bruce Rideau's room. Chicken wire, gauze, spools of rope, spray cans, glues, masonite board, wallpaper rolls, bathroom tiles, linoleum, and piles of vintage ma men's magazines. He could never throw away any of it. He was using male subject matter in a way that I had never seen. Cuttings from magazines he had gotten from 42nd Street integrated in collages with intersecting lines that served as visual police. I asked him why he just didn't take his own pictures. Oh, it's so much trouble, he said. I can't be bothered, and the printing would cost too much money. He had taken photographs at Pratt, but was too impatient with the time-consuming process of the darkroom. Meanwhile, searching out mail magazines was its own ordeal. I would stay in the front looking for Colin Wilson paperbacks, and Robert would go into the back. It felt a little scary, as if we were doing something wrong. The guys running those places were grouchy, and if you opened a sealed magazine, you had to buy it. These transactions made Robert edgy. The magazines were expensive, five dollars a piece, and he was always taking a chance on the contents. When he would finally choose one, we'd hurry back to the hotel. Robert would unseal the cellophane with the expectation of Charlie peeling back the foil of a chocolate bar in hopes of finding a golden ticket. Robert likened it to when he ordered a grab bag package from the back covers of comic books, sending for them without telling his parents. He would watch for the mail to intercept them and take his treasure to the bathroom, where he would lock the door, open the box, and spread out magic tricks, x-ray glasses, and miniature seahorses. Sometimes he'd luck out, and there would be several images he could use in an existing piece, or such a good one that it would trigger a whole new idea. But often the magazines were a disappointment 
and he'd toss them on the floor, frustrated and remorseful that he'd wasted our money. Sometimes his choice of imagery mystified me, as it did in Brooklyn, but his process did not. I had made cuttings from fashion magazines to make elaborate costumes for paper dolls. You should take your own pictures, I'd say. I said that over and over. Occasionally, I took my own pictures, but had them developed at a photo mat. I knew nothing about the darkroom. I got a glimpse of the printing process from watching Judy Lynn work. Judy, having graduated from Pratt, had committed herself to photography. When I would visit her in Brooklyn, we would sometimes spend the day taking photographs, I as her model. As artist and subject, we were suited for each other because we shared the same visual references. We drew on everything from Butterfield 8 to the French New Wave. She shot the stills from our imagined movies, although I didn't smoke. I would pocket a few of Robert's cools to achieve a certain look. For our Blaze Syndrome shots, we needed thick smoke for our Jean Moreau, uh, a black slip and a cigarette. When I showed him Judy's prints, Robert was amused by my personas. Patty, you don't smoke. He'd say, tickling me. Are you stealing my cigarettes? I thought he would be annoyed, since cigarettes were expensive. But the next time I went to Judy's, he surprised me with the last couple from his battered pack. I know I'm a fake smoker, I would say, but I'm not hurting anybody. And besides, I gotta enhance my image. It was all for Jean Moreau. Robert and I continued to go to Max's late at night on our own. We eventually graduated to the back room and sat in a corner under the Dan Flavin fluorescent sculpture, washed in red light. The gatekeeper, Dorothy Dean, had taken a liking to Robert and let us pass. Dorothy was small, black, and brilliant. She had Harlequin glasses and wore classic cardigan sweater sets and had gone to the finest schools. She stood before the entrance to the back room like an Abyssinian priest guarding the Ark. No one got past her unless she approved. Robert responded to her acid tongue and acerbic sense of humor. She and I stayed out of each other's way. I knew that Max's was important to Robert. He was so supportive of my work that I could not refuse him his nightly ritual. Nikki Ruskin allowed us to sit for hours nursing coffee and Coca-Cola's hardly ordering a thing. Some nights were totally dead. We could walk home exhausted and Robert would say we were never going back. Other nights were desperately animated, a dark cabaret infused with the manic energy of the 30s Berlin, of 30s Berlin. Screaming catfights erupted between frustrated actresses and indignant drag queens. They all seemed as if they were auditioning for a phantom and that phantom was Andy Warhol. I wondered if he cared about them at all. On one such night, Danny Fields came over and invited us to sit at the round table. This single gesture afforded us a trial re residency, which was an important step for Robert. He was elegant in his response. He just nodded and led me to the table. He didn't reveal at all how much it meant to him. For Danny's thoughtfulness toward us, I have always been grateful. Robert was at ease because, at last, he was where he wanted to be. I can't say I felt comfortable at all. The girls were pretty but brutal, perhaps because there seemed a low percentage of interested males. I could tell they tolerated me and were attracted to Robert. He was as much their target as their inner circle was his. It seemed as if they were all after him, male and female. But at the time, Robert was motivated by ambition, not sex. He was elated with clearing this small yet monumental hurdle, but privately I thought that the round table, even at the best of times, was innately doomed. Disbanded by Andy, banded by us, no doubt to be disbanded again to accommodate the next scene. I looked around at everyone bathed in the blood light of the back room. Dan Flavin had conceived his installation in response to the mounting death toll of the war in Vietnam. No one in the back room was slated to die in Vietnam, though few would survive the cruel plagues of a generation. I thought I could hear the voice of Tim Harden singing Black Sheep Boy 
as I returned with our laundry. Robert had gotten paid for a moving job with an old record player and had put on our favorite album. It was his surprise for me. We hadn't had a record player since Hall Street. It was the Sunday before Thanksgiving, though autumn was ending. It was a bright Indian summer kind of day. I had gathered up our laundry, slipped on an old cotton dress, wool stockings, and thick sweater, and headed toward 8th Avenue. I had asked Harry if he wanted any laundry done, but he responded in mock horror at the prospect of me touching his boxer shorts and scooted me away. I put the stuff in the washer with a fair amount of baking soda and walked the couple of blocks to Asia de Cuba to get a cup of cafe con leche. I folded our things. The song that we called ours came on. How can you hang on to a dream? We were both dreamers, but Robert was the one who got things done. I made the money, but he had drive and focus. He had plans for himself, but for me as well. He wanted us to develop our work, but there was no room. All the wall space was taken. There was no possibility for him to realize his blueprints for installations. His spray painting was bad for my persistent cough. He sometimes went up on the Chelsea roof, but it was getting too cold and windy. Finally, he decided he was going to find a raw space for us and began looking through the village voice and asking around. Then he had a piece of luck. We had a neighbor, an overweight sad sack and a rumpled coat, overcoat who walked his French bulldog back and forth on 23rd Street. He and his dog had identical faces of slack folding skin. We coded him Pigman. It's not nice. Robert noticed he lived a few doors down over the Oasis bar. One evening, he stopped to pet the dog and struck up a conversation. Robert asked him if he knew of any vacancies in his building, and Pigman told him he had the whole second floor, but the front room was just for storage. Robert asked if he could sublet it. At first, he was reluctant, but the dog liked Robert and he agreed, offering the front room starting January 1st for $100 a month. With a month's deposit, he could have the place for the balance of this year to clean it out. Robert wasn't sure where the money would come from, but sealed it with a handshake. Robert took me over to see the space. There were floor-to-ceiling windows overlooking 23rd Street, and we could see the YMCA and the top of the Oasis sign. It was everything he needed at least three times the size of our room, with plenty of light and a wall with about a hundred nails protruding. We can hang the necklaces there, he said. We? Of course, he said. You can work here too. It'll be our space. You can start drawing again. The first drawing will be of Pigman, I say. We owe him a lot. And don't worry about the money. We'll get it. Not long after, I found a 26-volume set of the complete Henry James for next to nothing. It was in perfect condition. I knew a customer at Shrivener's would want it. The tissue guards were intact, the gravures were fresh-looking, and there were, was no foxing on the pages. I cleared over $100, slipping $5.25 slipping five twenty dollar bills in a sock, I tied a ribbon around and gave it to Robert. He opened it saying, I don't know how you do it. Robert gave the money to Pigman to, and set to cleaning out the front half of the loft. It was a big job. I would stop in after work and he would be standing knee deep in the center of Pigman's incomprehensible debris. Dusty fluorescent tubings, rolls of insulation, racks of expired canned goods, half empty bottles of unidentified cleaning fluids, Vacuum cleaner bags, stacks of bent Venetian blinds, moldy boxes filling over with decades of tax forms, and bundles of stained National Geographics tied with red and white string, which I snapped up to braid for bracelets. He cleared, scrubbed, and painted the space. We borrowed buckets from the hotel, filled them with water, and carted them over. When we were finished, we stood together in silence, imagining the possibilities. We'd never had so much light. Even after he cleaned and painted half the large windows black, light still flooded in. We scavenged for a mattress, work tables, and chairs. I mopped the floor with water boiled with eucalyptus on our hot plate. The first things Robert bought, brought over from the Chelsea were our portfolios. Things were picking up at Max's. I stopped being so judgmental and got into the swing of things. 
Somehow, I was accepted, though I never really fit in. Christmas was coming, and there was a pervasive melancholy, as if everyone simultaneously remembered they had nowhere to go. Even here in the land of the so-called drag queens, Wayne County, Holly Woodlawn, Candy Darling, and Jackie Curtis were not to be categorized so lightly. They were performance artists, actresses, and comedians. Wayne was witty, Candy was pretty, and Holly had drama. But I put my money on Jackie Curtis. In my mind, she had the most potential. She would successfully manipulate a whole conversation just to deliver one of Betty Davis's killer lines. And she knew how to wear a house dress. With all her makeup, she was a 70s version of a 30s starlet. Glitter on her eyelids, glitter in the hair, glitter face powder. I hated glitter, and sitting with Jackie meant going home speckled all over. Right before the holidays, Jackie seemed distraught. I ordered her a snowball, a covered, coveted, unaffordable treat. It was a mound of devil's food cake filled with vanilla ice cream and covered with shredded coconut. She sat there eating it, plopping large glitter teals, tears into the melting ice cream. Candy Darling slinked in next to her, dipping her liqueured fingernail into the dish, offering a bit of comfort with her soothing voice. There was something especially poignant about Jackie and Candy as they embraced the imagined life of the actress. They both had aspects of Mildred Rogers, the coarse, illiterate waitress in Of Human Bondage. Candy had Kim Novak's looks, and Jackie had the delivery. Both of them were ahead of their time, but they didn't live long enough to see the time they were ahead of. Pioneers without a frontier, as Andy Warhol would say. It snowed on Christmas night. We walked to Times Square to see the white billboard proclaiming, War is over, if you want it. Happy Christmas! From John and Yoko. It hung over the bookstall where Robert bought most of his men's magazines between Childs and Benedict's two all-night diners. Looking up, we were struck by the ingenious humanity of this New York City tableau. Robert took my hand, and as the snow swirled around us, I glanced at his face. He narrowed his eyes and nodded in affirmation, impressed to see artists take on 42nd Street. For me, it was the message. For Robert, the medium. Newly inspired, we walked back to 23rd Street to look at our space. The necklaces hung on hooks, and he had tacked up some of our drawings. We stood at the window and looked out at the snow falling beyond the fluorescent oasis sign with its squiggly palm tree. Look, he said, it's snowing in the desert. I thought about a scene in Howard Hawke's movie Scarface where Paul Muni and his girl looking out the window at a neon sign that said, The world is yours. Robert squeezed my hand. The six, six days were coming to an end. Robert and I celebrated our birthdays. Robert turned 23, then I turned 23. The perfect prime number. Robert made me a tie rack with the image of the Virgin Mary. I gave him seven silver skulls on a length of leather. He wore the skulls. I wore a tie. We felt ready for the 70s. It's our decade, he said. For the page break on one, page 131. Viva stormed into the lobby with a garble-like inapproachability, attempting to intimidate Mr. Bard so he wouldn't ask her for rent back. The filmmaker Shirley Clark and the photographer Diane Arbus entered separately, each with a sense of agitated mission. Jonas Mekas, with his ever-present camera and secret smile, shot the obscure corners of life surrounding the Chelsea. I stood there holding a stuffed black crow. I had bought for next to nothing from the Museum of the American Indian. I think they wanted to get rid of it. I had decided to name it Raymond, after Raymond Russell, who wrote Locus Solus, I was thinking what a magical portal this lobby was when the heavy glass door opened as if swept by wind and a familiar figure in a black and scarlet cape entered. It was Salvador Dali. He looked around the lobby nervously and then seeing my crow, smiled. 
He placed his elegant bony hand atop my head and said, You are like a crow, a gothic crow. Well, I said to Raymond, just another day at the Chelsea. In mid-January, we, we, we met Steve Paul, who managed Johnny Winter. Steve was a charismatic entrepreneur who had provided the 60s with one of the great rock clubs in New York City, the scene, located on a side street near Times Square. It became a gathering spot for visiting musicians and late night jams. Dressed in blue velvet and perpetually bemused, he was a bit of Oscar Wilde, a bit of the Cheshire Cat. He was negotiating and recording a, con negotiating a recording contract for Johnny and had installed him in a suite of rooms at the Chelsea. We all collided one evening at the El Quixote in the short time that we spent with Johnny. I was intrigued by his intelligence and instinctive appreciation of art. In conversation, he was open and benevolently strange. We were invited to see him play at the Fillmore East, and I had never seen a performer interact with his audience with such complete assurance. He was fearless and joyously confrontational, spinning like a dervish and stalking the stage, swinging the veil of his pure white hair. Fast and fluid on guitar, he transfixed the crowd with his misaligned eyes and playfully demonic smile. On Groundhog Day, we attended a small party in the hotel for Johnny to celebrate his signing with Columbia Records. We spent most of the evening rapping with Johnny and Steve Paul. Johnny admired Robert's necklaces and offered to buy one. They also spoke of Robert designing him a black net cape. We've got a picture titled Tie Rack, December 30th, 1969. Hope you can kind of see. As I sat there, I noticed that I felt physically unstable, malleable, as if I were made of clay. No one seemed to indicate that I had changed in any way. Robert's, Johnny's hair seemed to droop like two long white ears. Steve Paul, in his blue velvet, was leaning into a mound of pillows, chain-smoking joints in slow motion, contrasting with the erratic presence of Matthew bounding in and out of the room. I felt so profoundly altered that I fled and locked myself in our old shared bathroom on the 10th floor. I wasn't certain what had happened to me. My experience most closely mirrored the eat me, drink me scene in Alice in Wonderland. I tried to access her restrained and curious reaction to her own psychedelic trials. I reasoned someone had dosed me with a form of hallucinogen. I had never taken any kind of drug before, and my limited knowledge came from observing Robert or reading descriptions of the drug-induced visions of Gautier, Michaud, and Thomas de, de Quincy. De Quincy? I huddled in a corner, not sure what to do. I certainly didn't want anyone to see me telescoping in size, even if it was all in my head. Robert, most likely high himself, searched the hotel until he found me and sat outside the door talking to me helping me to find my way back. Finally, I unlocked the door. We took a walk and then went back to the safety of our room. The next day we stayed in bed. When I got up, I dramatically wore dark glasses and a raincoat. Robert was very considerate and didn't tease me at all, not even about the raincoat. We had a beautiful day that blossomed into an unusually passionate night. I happily wrote of this night in my diary, adding a small heart like a teenage girl. It's hard to convey the speed at which our lives changed in the following months. We had never seemed closer, but our happiness would soon be clouded by Robert's anxiety over money. He couldn't get any work. He worried we wouldn't be able to keep both places. He continually made the rounds of the galleries, usually returning frustrated and demoralized. They don't really look at the work, he complained. They wind up trying to pick me up. I'd rather dig ditches than sleep with these people. He went to a placement service to get part-time work, but nothing panned out. Although he sold an occasional necklace, breaking into the fashion business was slow going. Robert got increasingly depressed about money, 
and the fact that it fell on me to get it. It was partially the stress of worrying about our financial position that drove him back to the idea of hustling. Robert's early attempts at hus hustling had been fueled by curiosity and the romance of Midnight Cowboy, but he found working on 42nd Street to be harsh. He decided to shift to Joe D'Alessandro territory on the east side near Bloomingdale's, where it was safer. I begged him not to go, but he was determined to try. My tears did not stop him, so I sat and watched him dress for the night ahead. I imagined him standing on a corner, flushed with excitement, offering himself to a stranger to make money for us. Please be careful, was all I could say. Don't worry, I love you. Wish me luck. Who can know the heart of youth? but youth itself. I awoke, and he was gone. There was a note to me on the desk. Couldn't sleep, it said. Wait for me. I straightened up and was writing a letter to my sister when he came into the room in a highly agitated state. He said he had to show me something. I quickly dressed and followed him into the space. We bounded up the stairs. Entering the space, I did a quick scan. His energy seemed to vibrate the air. Mirrors, light bulbs, and pieces of chain were spread on a length of black oilcloth. He'd begun a new installation, but he drew my attention to another work leaning against the necklace wall. He had stopped sketching, stretching canvas when he lost interest in painting, but he kept one of the stretchers. He had completely covered it with outtakes from his male magazines faces and torsos of young men wrapped the frame. He was nearly shaking. It's good, isn't it? Yes, I said. It's genius. It was a relatively simple piece, yet it seemed to have innate power. There was no excess. It was a perfect object. The floor was littered with paper cuttings. The room reeked of glue and varnish. Robert hung the frame on the wall, lit a cigarette, and we looked at it wordlessly together. It is said that children do not distinguish between living and inanimate objects. I believe they do. A, jaw, a child imparts a doll or tin soldier with magical life breath. The artist animates his work as the child his toys. Robert infused objects, whether for art or life, with his creative impulse his sacred sexual power. He transformed a ring of keys, a kitchen knife, or a simple wooden frame into art. He loved his work, and he loved his things. He once traded a drawing for a pair of riding boots, completely impractical, but almost spiritually beautiful. These he buffed and polished with the devotion of a groom dressing a greyhound. This affair with fine footwear reached its summit one evening as we returned from Max's. Turning the corner off 7th Avenue, we came upon a pair of alligator shoes aglow on the sidewalk. Robert scooped them up and pressed them to him, declaring them treasure. They were deep brown with silk laces showing no trace of wear. They tiptoed into a construction, which he often disassembled for the need of them. With a wad of tissue stuffed in the pointed toes, they were not a bad fit though perhaps incongruous with dungarees and turtleneck. He exchanged his turtleneck for a black, black net tee, adding a large cache of keys to his belt loop and discarding his socks. Then he was ready for a night at Max's, without money for cab fare, but his feet was splendid. The night of the shoes, as we came to call it, was for Robert a sign that we were on the right path, even as so many paths crossed each other. Gregory Corso could enter a room and commit instant mayhem, but he was easy to forgive because he had the equal potential to commit great beauty. Perhaps Peggy introduced me to Gregory, for the two of them were close. I took a great liking to him to say nothing that I felt he was one of our greatest poets. poets. My worn copy of his The Happy Birthday of Death lived on my night table. Gregory was the youngest of the beat poets. He had a ravaged handsomeness and a John Garfield swagger. He did not always take himself seriously, 
but he was dead serious about his poetry. Gregory loved Keats and Shelley and would stagger into the lobby with his trousers hanging low, eloquently spewing their verses. When I mourned my inability to finish any of my poems, he quoted Paul Valery to me. Poets don't finish poems, they abandon them. And then added, don't worry, you'll do okay, kid. I'd say, how do you know? And he'd reply, because I know. Gregory took me to the St. Mark's Poetry Project, which was a poets collective at the historic church on East 10th Street. We, when we went to listen to the poets read, Gregory would heckle them, punctuating the mundane with cries of, shit, shit, no blood, get a transfusion. In watching his reaction, I made a mental note to make certain I was never boring if I read my own poems one day. Gregory made lists of books for me to read, told me the best dictionary to own, encouraged and challenged me. Gregory Corso, Allen Ginsberg, and William Burroughs were all my teachers, each one passing through the lobby of the Chelsea Hotel, my new university. We've got another picture titled Hotel Chelsea, room 204, 1970. I don't know if it's Robert or someone else. It's Robert, I think. I'm tired of looking like a shepherd boy, Robert said, inspecting his hair in the mirror. Can you cut it like a 50s rock star? Though I was greatly attached to his unruly curls, I got out my shears and thought rockabilly as I sniffed. I sadly picked up a lock and pressed it in a book while Robert, taken with his new image, lingered at the mirror. In February, he took me to the factory to see rushes of trash. It was the first time we had been invited, and Robert was filled with anticipation. It was not, I was not moved by the movie. Perhaps it wasn't French enough for me. Robert circulated easily in the Warhol circle, though taken aback by the clinical atmosphere of the new factory and disappointed that Andy himself did not make an appearance. I was relieved to see Bruce Rudeau, and he introduced me to his friend Diane Podluski, who played Holly Woodlawn's sister in the film. She was a sweet-natured Southern girl with a huge afro and Moroccan clothing. I recognized her from a Diane Arbus photograph taken in the Chelsea. More boy than girl. As we were leaving in the elevator, Fred Hughes, who managed the factory, addressed me in a condescending voice. Oh, your hair is very Joan Baez. Are you a folk singer? I don't know why, as I admired her, but it bugged me. Robert took my hand. Just ignore him, he said. I found myself in a dark humor. One of those nights when the mind starts looping bothersome things. I got to thinking about what Fred Hughes had said. Screw him, I thought, annoyed at being dismissed. I looked at myself in the mirror over the sink. I realized that I hadn't cut my hair any different since I was a teenager. I sat on the floor and spread out the few rock magazines I had. I usually bought them to get any new pictures of Bob Dylan, but it wasn't Bob I was looking for. I cut out all the pictures I could find of Keith Richards. I studied them for a while and took up the scissors, macheting my way out of the folk era. I washed my hair in the hallway bathroom and shook it dry. It was a liberating experience. When Robert came home, he was surprised, but pleased. What possessed you? He asked. I just shrugged. But when we went to Max's, my haircut caused quite a stir. I couldn't believe all the fuss over it. Though I was still the same person, my social status suddenly elevated. My Keith Richards haircut was a real discourse magnet. I thought of the girls I knew back in high school. They dreamed of being singers, but wound up hairdressers. I desired neither vocation, but in weeks to come, I would be cutting a lot of people's hair and singing at La Mama. Someone at Max's asked me if I was androgynous. I asked what that meant. You know, like Mick Jagger. I figured that must be cool. I thought the word meant both beautiful and ugly at the same time. Whatever it meant, with just a haircut, I miraculously turned androgynous overnight. Opportunities suddenly arose. Jackie Curtis asked me to be in her play Femme Fatale. 
I had no problem replacing a boy who played the male counterpart of Penny Arcade, shotgunning lines like, he could take her or leave her, and he took her, and then he left her. La Mama was one of the earliest experimental theaters off-Broadway with a few more offs. I had been in a few plays in college, Phaedra in Euripides' Hippolytus, and Madame Dubonnet in The Boyfriend. I liked performing, but I dreaded the memorizing and all the pancake makeup they have you wear on stage. I really didn't understand the avant-garde, though I thought it might be fun working with Jackie and her company. Jackie gave me the part without auditioning, so I had no real idea what I was getting into. I was sitting in the lobby, trying to appear that I wasn't waiting for Robert. I worried when he disappeared into the labyrinth of his hustling world. Unable to concentrate, I sat in my usual spot, bent over my orange composition book, containing my cycle of poems for Brian Jones. I was dressed in my Song of the South getup, straw hat, briar rabbit jacket, work boots, and pegged pants, and was hammering away at the same set of phrases when I was interrupted by an oddly familiar voice. What you doing, darling? I looked up into the face of a stranger sporting the perfect pair of dark glasses. Writing. Are you a poet? Maybe. I shifted in my seat, acting disinterested, pretending like I didn't recognize him. But there was no mistaking the drawl in his voice, nor his shady smile. I knew exactly who I was facing. He was the guy in Don't Look Back, the other one, Bobby Newirth, the peacemaker provocateur, Bob Dylan's alter ego. He was a painter, singer-songwriter, and risk-taker. He was a trusted confidant to many of the great minds and musicians of his generation, which was just a beat before mine. To hide how impressed I was, I got up, nodded, and headed toward the door without saying goodbye. He called out to me. Hey, where did you learn to walk like that? I turned from Don't Look Back. He just laughed and asked me to join him in the El Quijote for a shot of tequila. I wasn't a drinker, but I downed a shot, without the lemon and salt, just to seem cool. He was easy to talk to, and we covered everything from Hank Williams to abstract expressionism. He seemed to take a liking to me. He took the notebook out of my hands and checked it out. I guess he saw potential for, he said, did you ever think of writing songs? I wasn't sure how to answer. Next time I want a song out of you, he said, as we exited the bar. That was all he had to say. When he left, I pledged to write him a song. I had fooled with lyrics for Matthew, made up a few Appalachian style songs for Harry, but didn't think much of it. Now I had a real mission, and someone worthy of having a mission for. Robert came home late, sullen and a little angry that I had drinks with a strange guy, but the next morning he agreed it was inspiring that someone like Bob Newirth was interested in my work. Maybe he'll be the one to get you to sing, he said, but I always remember who wanted you to sing first. Robert had always liked my voice. When we lived in Brooklyn, he would ask me to sing him to sleep, and I would sing him the songs of Piaf and child ballads. I don't want to sing. I just want to write songs for him. I want to be a poet, not a singer. You can be both, he said. Robert seemed conflicted much of the day, alternating between affection and moodiness. I could feel something brewing, but Robert didn't want to talk about it. The following days were unnervingly quiet. He slept a lot, and when he'd awake, he would ask me to read him my poems, especially ones I wrote for him. At first, I worried that he might have been harmed. Between his long silences, I considered the possibility that he had met someone. I recognized the silences as signs. We had been through this before, though we didn't speak about it. I slowly prepared myself for the changes that would surely come. Robert and I were still intimate, and I think it was hard for both of us to bring everything out into the open. Paradoxically, he seemed to want to draw me closer. Perhaps it was the closeness before the end, like a gentleman buying his mistress jewels before telling her it's all over. 
Sunday, full moon. Robert was edgy and abruptly, abruptly needed to go out. He looked at me for a long time. I asked if he was okay. He said he didn't know. I walked him to the corner. I stood on, there on the street, looking at the moon. Later, feeling anxious, I went and got coffee. The moon had turned blood red. When he finally returned, he put his head on my shoulder and fell asleep. I didn't confront him. Later, he would reveal he had crossed a line. He had been with a fellow and not for money. I was able to give him some measure of acceptance. My armor still had its vulnerable points, and Robert, my knight, had pierced a few, though without desiring to do so. He and I began to give each other more gifts, small things we made or found in a dusty corner of a pawn shop window, things no one else wanted. Crosses of braided hair, tarnished charms, and haiku valentines made with bits of ribbon and leather. We left notes, little cakes, things, as if we could plug up the hole, rebuild the crumbling wall, fill the wound we had opened to let other experiences in. Okay, we've got another picture. Hotel Chelsea, room 204, 1970. Two of them on the bed. We hadn't seen Pigman for a few days, but had heard his dog wailing. Robert called the police and they pried the door open. Pigman had died. Robert went in to identify the body and they took Pigman and the dog away. The loft space at the back was twice as big. Though he felt terrible, Robert couldn't help but covet it. We were sure we would be kicked out of the studio as we had no lease. But Robert went to see the landlord and came clean about our presence there. The owner felt it would be difficult to rent because of the lingering smell of death and dog piss. Instead, and instead offered us the entire floor for $30 less than our room at the Chelsea, and two months grace to clean and paint it. To appease the pigman gods, I did a drawing called, I saw a man, he was walking his dog, and when I finished it, seemed at when I finished it, Robert seemed at peace with Pigman's sad departure. It was clear we could not afford to live at the Chelsea and also take the whole floor above the Oasis Bar. I didn't really want to leave the Chelsea, its identification with poets and writers, Harry and our bathroom in the hall. We talked about it a lot. I would have the smaller space in the front and he would have the back. The money we saved would pay for the utilities. I knew it was a more practical thing to do, even an exciting prospect. We would both have the space to do our work and be close to one another, but it was also very sad, especially for me. I loved living in the hotel, and I knew when we left, everything would change. What, would, what will happen to us? I asked. There will always be us, he answered. Robert and I had not forgotten the vow that we had exchanged in the taxi from the Allerton to the Chelsea. It was clear we were not ready to go out on our own. I will only be a door away, he said. And we will stop there on page 146 if you are in the paperback copy following along with me. And I will catch you next time. We are just about halfway. Look at that. So uh, next time we'll pick up there and I hope that you have a good week and enjoy this section. Bye.